Well, hello everyone, welcome back to the channel and to another Brutally Honest review. And this one, slightly different because I think it's the first Brutally Honest I've done with an electric car. And what a special electric car to start it with because I'm sure you can see it from its very recognizable shape. It's a Porsche, it's the Taycan, and it's the GTS Sport Turismo, which is the estate version, if you like. And this one in a beautiful carmine red really complements the car, actually, this color. And I'm a bit of a sucker for red cars in general. Now, I was particularly excited to get my hands on this car because contrary to what you might think or might be perceived, I'm actually a, a bit of a fan of, of EV cars. Certainly when it comes to a driver's perspective, i.e. how they are to drive, I think they're really fun and they present something entirely different from any combustion car, just in the way that they deliver power, in the way that they have a lower center of gravity and just how they handle and perform. And with all the EV experiences I've had previously, and it's not been that many, I've maybe had four or five EV cars on test before. I've always really, really enjoyed the way that they drive, but this is potentially the most expensive EV I've ever had the pleasure of testing. And I'm just really keen to see where everything is in terms of infrastructure and actually just daily ability and, and living with an electric car because it's all that ever really gets talked about, isn't it? When electric cars come up as a topic of conversation. It's, oh, well, you can't charge them. The network's rubbish. They're always broken. It's really expensive. That's a hot topic at the moment. And all sorts of questions, really, which I think until you get behind the wheel of one of these and, and use them for a good period of time, and I've only had this this week, and I don't think it's enough time really to get an overview of it, but until you get some form of experience using one as your daily driver, it's hard to really comment on those things. But I feel like this week I've had a mixed experience and I'm excited to share that with you today. Something I want to talk about straight off the bat with this car is Porsche's charging service. So obviously charging is the biggest thing you're going to consider probably when moving into an electric vehicle and Porsche are trying to make this a much easier and seamless experience and more affordable experience for their customers. So with the new Taycan or Taycan, I'm never quite sure how to pronounce it, you get three years free subscription to the Porsche charging service. After that three years, it's £179 a year, but I think it represents pretty good value because what it essentially gets you, oh, that's another Carmine Red, might be Guards Red, Cayman that just went past. This thing will never sound like that, but we'll get onto that more as we drive the car later on. But the Porsche charging service gets you access to over half a million chargers across different networks. That's the key thing um, all, all around Europe. So a bit less than that if you're just in the UK, but a lot of chargers. Now, this is from Ionity, Shell, BP, a mix of them essentially that you can get access to with this service. You get a card, which I've been using, which is in the car, or you can activate some of these chargers from an application on your phone. But the key benefit also is that it gets you discounted charging because charging is something that has become more expensive and is a bit of a concern for current and future EV owners. Where is it going to go? Is it going to become more expensive than a combustion car? So this is really interesting because it gives you discounted charging across multiple providers, which means you don't also have to sign up to a bunch of, of different charging providers depending on where you're going and, and what's available. For example, the Ionity ultra fast chargers that are roughly around 74p per kilowatt hour of charge, uh, it caps the pricing at 30 pence with the Porsche charging service. So if you were charging this car up, which is essentially 87 kilowatts, the battery from zero to 100, at 74 pence, it'd be something like 65 quid. And that only gets you around 280 miles of, of charge on a good day. But with that capped at 30 pence, it comes down to around 25 quid. So a huge, huge saving there in terms of, of cost of charge. And yeah, like, like I say, that the ability to use this at various different network providers is a bit of a godsend and, and just a big checkbox in the convenience list. So uh, it's a really interesting service that I've been trying to exclusively use this week with my time in the car. And we'll talk about it a little bit later, but I've found it to be mixed, but generally on the good side. And I think truthfully, if I had this car for a month and I had a specific commute to do, I would have absolutely no problems by the end of that month. I would have completely ironed out exactly where I'm gonna use. I'd have certain backup chargers that I'd, I'd like to use if, if other ones were occupied. And it does give you a very good overview of what's available, what's working and, and things like that. So it's a pretty good service considering I've in five days managed to, to pick it up and become familiar with it. It's fairly user-friendly. 
and the only thing that's ever let it down is the actual charger providers them, themselves. We'll talk about that a little bit more extensively as we drive the car, but I just wanted to mention that first and foremost with, with this, because it's a thing that would come with, with a new Taycan and, and it's a little bit of a game changer for EV owners. There are things out there like Ionity Passport, which is a subscription to Ionity themselves, and that would probably give you comparable charging, but obviously it limits you then to just their network. So the Porsche charging service doesn't have that issue and is a big bonus in that sense. And a great step actually, for just EV usage in general. So this Taycan GTS Sport Turismo then will cost you £111,000 before options. This one has tested, I think is at about 126 with around 15Ks worth of options. Three grand of that is taken up by the lovely GTS interior. You've got 1200 quid on the Bose sound system, which is you know really worth having. So it does add up quite quickly. And it is a very, very expensive car. The first thing that strikes you though, and it seems to be a common theme with lots of new cars, but this one in particular, is just the sheer size of it. It's a tiny, tiny bit under five meters long, this car, which if I'm right in remembering, my long wheelbase seven series from 2008 or seven, that car was, was exactly the same length, which is quite crazy to think that a traditional limo from less than 20 years ago is now the same length as a standard Estate car that you can buy off the shelf. It's a it's a long car, but the most notable thing, and I did say this with the 911 Turbo S recently, is it's wide. This is over 2.1 meters wide with the wing mirrors out. So as you're driving it, it's actually only about 60 millimeters or six centimeters narrower than the newest Range Rover, which is quite crazy to think when you look at the size of that thing. Actually, this thing's not far off either in width or length. It is a lot lower though, and something I love about the way this thing looks is how it sits. It's so squat, it has air suspension, so it's actually in the lowest mode at the moment because I think it looks the best on camera. I certainly wasn't driving over this terrain with the air suspension all the way lowered. But, I mean, I'm towering way above it. It sits really, really nice and low, which obviously helps with the center of gravity and weight distribution, all that sort of good stuff. But from the driver's seat, you really feel like you're in a supercar you feel like you're in a 911 um, because of how low it is and the view you get around you. And we'll go into that when we, when we jump in the car. But look, from an exterior perspective, I think we can all agree, this is a gorgeous, gorgeous looking car. With this being the estate version and the way it looks, it very much gives me Vanquish Zagato shooting brake vibes. Those cars are worth absolutely hideous amounts of money these days. But I think if you part them next to each other, you'd notice so much resemblance and only in a good way, because that is a gorgeous, gorgeous car. But I think we can all agree that this is a stunning car. This and the saloon version, I think, is also a real looker. EVs in general tend to be quite nice looking, although now I say that I can think of quite a few that aren't. Um, but it does look every bit worth its money from the flesh. So let's jump inside because I think it gets even better on the inside actually. It's probably the best thing about this entire car is its interior. And then finally, we'll, we'll take it out for a drive and I'll talk a little bit more specifically about my experience with using this as my daily car uh, over the last week or so. Okay, so inside the Taycan and I was initially blown away with this interior when I first stepped into it at the start of the week at Porsche Reading when I was picking it up. I was, I was blown away. It was utterly, utterly gorgeous, and it still is. We've still got this dial display in front of us, as with all Porsches. It's very, very recognizable if you've driven any of the other newer models. Beautiful, beautiful steering wheel. Again, if you've driven Porsche before, completely familiar. You even have a drive mode, Manatino switch, like you would on a 911, or other models for that matter. And this one has a beautiful Alcantara clad rim which is my favorite by far that I've, I've had the pleasure of using before. It just feels gorgeous in your hands. And at this time of year, because I'm a bit of a sad old man, so I've got them here, I wear these driving gloves um, because I'm a sad old man and it just feels nicer to, to drive with them, uh, especially if the wheel is cold. This one, I, I don't bother wearing them because it just feels so nice in my hands without the gloves. I like the carbon fiber trim that's in this particular example. And probably my favorite thing of this whole interior are these two cup holders. They're absolutely massive. I've never seen a car in this country with cup holders this size. And it's about time that we got cup holders that would actually fit most flasks or big water bottles that you want to carry with you. The seats in this car, are utterly fantastic. Genuinely, probably the most comfortable seats I've ever sat in. 
even compared to the new Range Rover or some old ones like in my XC90, I have had zero problems with these seats. And I've done a good five or 600 miles this week in the car. You just sink into them without needing to make any adjustments. And as soon as you do sit down, as with all Porsches I've ever driven, the driving position is just spot on. I love the view you get too. The big wing mirrors, they remind me of the mirrors you'd get on a Ferrari 488. They look very similar. And the best thing about it all is the view you get over the front wheel arches. Again, a bit like a Ferrari. And Porsche probably won't love me comparing everything to a Ferrari here, but I think it's high praise. They just, you know, arc up over your line of sight and look fantastic. And this thing really feels like a supercar. And I don't know of any other cars which are really designed for daily use that feel this much like a supercar. So in terms of being in the car and, and driving it, it does feel superbly special. And that was something I was not expecting, especially with it being an electric car. I thought it would be extremely sterile and, and dull like most electric cars are, but this one isn't. It's really fantastic, really makes you feel something when you step inside. Having this screen down here it is nice. You can control your heated seats on there. You can also click this button here to see your battery status and you can use it to pre-select what comes up on the main screen. So if I want my Apple CarPlay, I've just clicked that button, it comes up. If I want to adjust things to do with the car, I can press here want to make a phone call etc and also there's this touchpad at the bottom which I can use as almost like a trackpad on a laptop um, to also control this this top screen but annoyingly in Apple CarPlay say if I'm on Spotify and I've had enough of Rammstein for a minute which is rare and I want to scroll through some alternative music uh, you, it doesn't seem to be usable with Apple CarPlay so I can't manipulate the Apple CarPlay with the trackpad which would be nice but Otherwise, this is actually quite nice to use. It's, this is this is probably the best uh, thing about having this lower screen is the ability to control the upper screen like this with one finger and not having to take your eyes off the road as much to actually interact with it using touch. But just in general on any car, this digitalization of essential controls, I find to be quite frustrating. And I, I do wonder if manufacturers will ever just bring buttons back because I suppose there's nothing environmentally unfriendly about having more buttons. In terms of technology also with this is I've connected this car to my Porsche app. And I know this has been a feature on cars for a long time, but it works very well in this, is the pre-cooling, pre-heating function. So pretty much every morning I've gone out in the car, about five or 10 minutes before I've switched the button on my phone. And when I get in the car, the heated seat is already on, the heated wheel is on, and the car's nice and warm. That's just a lovely feature on any car, but it does work very well on this and the way in fact that it does interact with the app on your phone is really nice wherever the car is you can see it on your phone you can also use that to look up where your nearest charging stations are if you have the porsche charging uh, subscription that i talked about earlier you can obviously filter it to only show those chargers and you can also filter the wattage or the rate of charge as well so with a car like this with such a big battery at 87 usable kilowatts i think it's actually 93 you don't really want to be charging certainly anywhere less than 50 kilowatts an hour because you can do the maths even at 50 kilowatts an hour it's going to take you an hour and a half at least to get 80 90 percent of charge into the car so you can filter it on on the porsche app to make sure you're not going for anything less than that but where this thing is best is when you use the ultra fast network because it can charge at up to 270 kilowatts an hour and although I've not actually managed to find one during my week with this car because I've not been going anywhere that's actually near one I did use a 175 kilowatt charger the other day and it was quite impressive I have to say I, I needed to stop for lunch I pulled up it was a little bit of a detour five minutes off my route but I found it pretty easily plugged the car in scanned the card took about a minute in total before it started charging went in grabbed a sandwich bottle of water ate the sandwich drunk the water uh, by which point I'd had an extra 100 miles of charge on the car so that was quite impressive and when they do work like that they're fantastic and and convenient and I also really enjoy the charging I find it really fun I love numbers I'm a bit of a nerd and a bit of a numbers freak so I was genuinely <laughs> it's really weird but it made me really happy knowing that whilst I had gone in to get my sandwich and my water the charging was happening outside. So sometimes when I go and fill up a car with fuel and I'm in a rush to get somewhere, obviously you fill the car up, it takes five minutes if it needs fully filling at most. 
then you get into the service station and there's a huge queue because Samantha's doing her weekly shop in the in the little waitrose in there and she's scanning all of her items and you get really annoyed because the car's sat out there ready to go and you just want to get in it and leave and, and pay for the fuel that you've just used. But with this, I found myself stuck in a queue waiting to pay for my sandwich for the very same reason, but it made me happy because I thought, well, the longer I'm stuck in this queue, the more charge I'm going to have. So it's kind of backwards in a way because obviously if I didn't have to charge the car, that wouldn't be a problem, but you kind of, I enjoy it. I enjoy the whole process and, and when it's working, that is the key here, when it is working and it doesn't inconvenience you or something doesn't go wrong, it's fun and I love it. I really enjoy the electric car experience. So let's go for a drive. I don't think there's much else to talk about in here. I mean, it's gorgeous, it's functional. I love all the materials, they're fantastic. Um, but other than that, let's just take this car for a drive because this is where we, we need to talk about most of the things with this Taycan. And it's, it's where it will become a little bit more brutally honest uh, as a little bit of a hint there. So setting off in the Taycan then, and it's electric, so there is no drama and almost no noise. And inside the cabin, it's very, very quiet and almost eerily so when you don't have any music on. The car is really low to the ground and you've got, as I mentioned, those lovely view of the wing haunches at the front and the wing mirrors at the side. And you feel like you're in a supercar and it handles accordingly too. The steering is very Porsche, very, very responsive, very direct, quite communicative and just all around lovely. This being the GTS model, we're playing with around 520 horsepower or around 590 if you launch it but it's more than enough and actually a really nice balance because it's still quick enough to make all your passengers tummy go funny but it's not so quick that you're going to scare yourself by planting it and most of the time you really don't need to because it it drives just like any geared car would really it drives in such a way that you don't feel like there's a lot of power there it's very very unintimidating and user friendly the take out on the brakes there and by doing that we're seeing how much regen we're putting back into that battery if you want to drive it nice and sportily you can put it into sport plus mode and what that does is automatically turns on the artificial sound and it even simulates the sound of gear changes i have to say i really quite enjoy it until the other day i was driving around town i opened the windows and i realized it played it on the outside too and i thought this is really embarrassing. But actually what I've started doing is whenever I drive into a residential area or I'm pulling into home, any sort of place where there's pedestrians, I turn it into Sport Plus or just switch the sound on because I think actually it's probably a good thing to let people know that you're coming. So um, I do actually quite like the artificial sound in this car. It's not like one of those ones that's sort of pumped in for extra induction. It's its own character, it has its own sound it's quite a fun one but truth be told 90% of the time I'm driving I have it in either normal or range mode and driving around town I've noticed that if you don't activate the the lift on the suspension it will catch on bumps I think partly because it's quite a long car but it is very low as well so you do have to do the whole sideways over speed bumps thing if you want to be really careful or raise the suspension up which you can do up to 20 miles an hour I think so around London it was a little bit annoying because I was on the limiter at 21 miles an hour because obviously the speed over reads ever so slightly but at 21 it lowers the suspension automatically so um, it'd be nice if that was a slightly higher speed limit like 25 or even 30 that you can keep the uh, air suspension racing to but it rides really really well it's a really comfortable car it's set up sportily but of course this is a gts it is a powerful variant of, of the taycan and the way it makes you feel, you know, it does feel like it, it should be quite a sporty setup. Um, in normal mode, though, it seems a little bit softer. I guess the air suspension is a little bit higher, and it's a very pleasant ride. So nothing really to complain about. I think, you know, I've been lucky enough to drive quite a few Porsches now, and for all intents and purposes, despite the fact it's lacking an engine, it feels like a Porsche. And that is what, you know, everyone's been saying about Taycan for the years and years that it's been out now and it's the first one driving it but it's true it just feels like a Porsche 
which by the way <laughs> is a massive massive compliment because any Porsche that I've driven has has been has been wonderful so yeah 15 20 miles an hour now let's sit at 20 I'm just gonna put it in sport plus and I'm just gonna squirt it up to 60 so 20 miles an hour three two one and it's <laughs> that was 60 by the way it's not often that cars that you're behind the wheel of give you that tummy sensation but this does and most electric cars do there's just the way it's that instantaneous power and torque and unrelenting power and torque has this real effect on your body uh, that you can't really get anywhere else in fact funnily enough my wife i always take my wife out in these cars because she she really loves cars actually which is really cool and i took her out in the turbo s and i was saying look prepare yourself because this thing is a rocket ship 0 to 60 in 2.7 seconds this is by far like the fastest car you've ever been in i did a launch control with her in that turbo s and she was like uncompromised she was un unflustered and i was just shocked because for me that's like rapid that car but she was like it doesn't feel that fast for whatever reason and then i took her out in this and she got that sensation said this is so much faster than that turbo s i said it's not but that's what electric cars do to you they just give you this utter sensation of speed that you don't get in all combustion cars so really when it comes down to the drive of, of this take and there's nothing nothing to complain about it's, it's beautiful it's really really well made obviously it, it drives fantastically my only slight complaint with it is actually the brakes feel slightly confidence uninspiring sometimes they feel a bit like the brakes on my old Jag where you need to push the pedal quite far to get any real response and there's never really a sensation of the inputs that you're doing actually slowing the car down it doesn't feel like you're getting as much responsiveness from the brakes as you would expect with the the travel that you've got on the pedal if that makes sense so they're slightly I don't know slow to respond or spongy spongy is the word they feel quite spongy the brakes but obviously um, it's an electric car and so they do act differently with the whole regen thing going on I'm just speeding up actually because you hear that there's a Maserati Gran Turismo in front of me and uh, yeah I mean that's something that a Taycan or any electric car will never quite sound like 4.7 litre V8 can't really be beaten can it if you're a petrol head on a road like this you are very aware of that width we talked about earlier it is a big car and it feels as such especially with it being so low you're very conscious of any potholes or or anything like that that you don't really want to run into and you see i've got a tractor reversing into me and an oncoming vehicle sorry about that so look the Taycan is fast it's very comfortable Suspension can be slightly fidgety at times, but it's a sporty car. It's set up that way Let's talk about the the battery and the range of this thing Once that Maserati pulls away, sorry, I just love the sound of those Maserati V8s So the range of this car then the all-important R word when it comes to EV 280 miles is the quoted combined range of this Taycan GTS. I'm filming this in December and so batteries don't do as well in cold weather so you're never going to get particularly near that at this time of year but what I've found is with a full charge it will do reliably about 230 miles even in the winter which is not so bad but then when you talk about charging and paying full price for charging if you are doing that and this is not a Taycan specific issue this is just EV issue in general 74 pence per kilowatt hour of charge at an Ionity super fast charger for something like this that's 87 kilowatts if you fully charge that it's about 60 quid to fully charge it and then in the winter that's only getting you 230 miles now if I put 60 quid of diesel into a 4.4 TDV8 Range Rover I would get probably about 300 miles of range so in terms of the expense of using one of these electric cars 
the price of charging is something to watch out for because it has gone up an awful lot and I do wonder how long it will be before they bring road tax onto electric cars and, and things like that. So it is something to consider, but obviously as I mentioned earlier, with the Porsche charging service, you're limiting that cost of an ultra fast charge to around 30 pence. And so, you know, that actually makes it a lot more attractive in that sense. It would be almost half the price at that point of your average combustion car to get the same or equivalent range. In terms of charging times, well, if you can reliably find a 270 kilowatt charger, this will do about 80% of the charge in around 22 minutes, which is longer granted than if you were filling up with petrol or diesel. But I personally, on, on longer journeys where I'll be doing 200 plus miles, will need to stop. Um, and I'll, I'll try and plan these journeys sometimes around breakfast, lunch or, or dinner. And actually sometimes taking a, a sit down meal in a service station is quite nice. Um, it's a nice way to break up the journey, especially for traveling with someone, which I often am. And in that scenario, uh, charging for 20 minutes is, is almost perfect, if anything, too quick. So if you can reliably find and, and use those chargers, this is great and it works really well. Where I found some difficulties is recently, actually during this week, I've had one journey in particular, which was very last minute, and I had to drive to Essex in the car knowing that I didn't have enough charge to get there and back without stopping. But I took the car anyway, because I thought it'd be a perfect test of the range and the capabilities of the Taycan and to see in the real world what actually happened. And uh, I have to say, the journey there was fine, I didn't charge, I opted to charge on the way home. And it was a little bit of a palaver, only because finding the charger that was closest to my route that was also available and fast enough and included in the Porsche charging service was a little bit complicated. Now, I could have obviously sat and, and done this before I left, but I realized I hadn't and had to pull over en route to sort all of this out, which obviously added a little bit of journey time. You can send chargers to the vehicle. So you can go on your phone, find a charger, send it to the vehicle, um, or send where you're going and it will automatically find appropriate charge points en route. Although I wasn't having much success with this, I wasn't seeming to, to find it on the navigation system. Maybe I was doing something wrong, but also I like to use Google Maps or Waze and Apple CarPlay and it doesn't integrate into that. So it was a little bit of a faff finding the correct charger, but credit where credit's due, I found the charger and I described this situation earlier. It was a 175 kilowatter, turned up straight in, plugged the car in, scanned the card, took about a minute for it all to activate and switch on. I walked into the shop, grabbed myself my sandwich and my water, like I said, sat in the car for I think about 15 minutes and I had uh, just over 100 extra miles of range, which was more than enough to get me home. So in that instance, it, it worked really, really well. There was another instance yesterday though where I was down to around 30 miles. I had a meeting in southwest London and I thought, you know what, I'm going to drive back to Buckinghamshire later, which I need 60, 70 miles of range for. So I'm just going to try and get it all done now. There was a super fast shell charger about three or four miles up the road in Twickenham the wrong way. I thought, look, I'll just go there and use that. And unfortunately, when I got there, the charger was out of order. I then went to a different shell charger, completely the other way in, in Ashford towards Heathrow, and the same situation. Um, the charger wasn't working. There was the second one, but it wasn't available. It was it was being used. I then subsequently found a BP charger, which was only 50 kilowatts uh, per hour of charge, including the Porsche charging service, and, and I used that with, without, without any problems. But that took me a long time. I went out my way twice uh, unsuccessfully and then ended up using a 50 kilowatt charger which I then I think we sat at for about 58 minutes basically an hour to get a good 100 120 miles of, of charge into the car so in that instance it, it didn't work for me very well and it was an inconvenience and a pain the thing is though if I was to buy an electric car I would have it as my second or third car 
and I would only use it for journeys that I'm I'm used to doing. So I've said to Katie for a while now, one of my favourite cars I've ever had on test was I had a Fiat 500 EV for a month, and I absolutely loved that car to bits. So much so that I genuinely have thought about buying or leasing one at several occasions in the last year. Not quite done it because Katie doesn't like it that much actually, but something like that that you can charge overnight at home and use for runs around town and maybe a short commute, knowing you only need to charge the car once a week is absolutely perfect. I think the problem is where you end up using these electric cars for journeys that are unplanned and for lots of people that's a very rare eventuality and so they could probably have an electric car as their only vehicle but for me and the sort of driving that I do where I'm all over the place at a moment's notice sometimes I wouldn't feel comfortable having an electric car as my only car. Now you know I understand I'm a relatively inexperienced EV user and I've had this Porsche for five days and I've tried to experience it as much as I can to get a rounded overview of how everything is, but you, you can't, you simply can't fast track time. Um, I would need like three months with something like this to really get a handle on what it's, what it's like. And I know from the five days that I've had with this car, I've picked things up very, very quickly. The use of the, the Porsche app, the My Porsche app, just learning where, the charging facilities and stuff are now around me exactly how the car responds to certain types of driving styles and heated seats and all this sort of stuff you, you do I've, I've picked up so much of that in just five days so i think you know with such a short amount of time it's hard to to say exactly what it's like but i can see that over a longer span potentially my experience as a as a whole would be better with everything i've been trying to do in the week with the car I have run into issues, I've run into chargers not working, but I have really just been going into it blindly and trying to use an electric car as I would a combustion car. If I was to go and buy an electric car, I would 100% pay to have a seven kilowatt home charger installed because for something even like this with a huge 87 kilowatt battery, a seven kilowatt with a 10 hour overnight charge would get me that 80, 85% of battery charge overnight. So. If I owned one and I had that and I you know, did known journeys and, and learned the network a bit better, I can see this being really feasible and an enjoyable car to use as a daily driver. But at the moment, from the experience I've had, I don't feel like it's quite there yet as a direct replacement to combustion. But listen, there's many people out there more qualified than I to talk about this. And I can only really talk about the experience I've had this week and stuff I've seen using electric cars previously to this one as well. I think the Taycan is an absolutely gorgeous thing and to be honest I would love to have one in my garage so to speak and I would if I had the money. This is probably the electric car I'd go for because it is just beautiful to look at, absolutely stunning to drive, it makes you feel special more so than any other electric car I've driven. This GTS as well is a perfect blend like I say of, of performance but also being quite sensible and um, you know if you do want to get one on the used market there's big savings to be had because we all know that new electric cars are taking a huge hit on depreciation and the used market in general is something we don't know enough about yet because they just haven't been around long enough but as we can see there are some real big bargains to be had with early take cans if you want to pay half price for one um, for example so it's a really interesting space like that that's the ultimate thing for me is that i find these electric cars really interesting i think it's obvious that it's getting much much better the infrastructure is getting much much better the reliability of the infrastructure is improving and with services like the porsche charging service there's more options available to the consumer to keep costs down and to have a reliable place and places to get range into your cars. So yeah, thank you so much to Porsche for my week with this. It's been real, real eye-opener. The car, I can't fault, it's wonderful. I absolutely love it. I wish maybe it had a slightly higher range, that would be fantastic, but obviously if I was testing this during the summer, I might have an extra 50 miles. So, you know, it's just wonderful, uh, really wonderful, and I, I've really enjoyed my week with it. So thank you to Porsche. Uh, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one very, very soon.